We looked at what's going on there in uh, Daniel 7, and we'll just, just reference it to get us back uh, up to speed this morning. Um, sometimes when I was talking with a guy who's uh, going through seminary right now, and he's, he has a, a preaching opportunity in front of him, and so he's asking me preaching questions, and I said, you know, he's, and he's learning, uh, he's in a class right now about how, how to understand Scripture. And, um, you know, Scripture has so much meaning, and it's so, it's so rich. And I, 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 I've um, told some of these guys going into uh, pastoral ministry, you know, when you see this, and this is what our uh, teachers said when we were in pastoral training, um, when you uh, look at the Scriptures, your problem will not be, if you're preaching from the Scriptures, your problem will not be, how can I fill 20 minutes? It will be, how can I not go on for two hours? And you'll have to leave all this stuff on the cutting floor uh, as you edit out all these things. And so I told him about you know, this last week and this week that I you know, th th finished this sermon that was two hours long and uh, then said, well, I can't do two hours. And so I cut it in half. And so we did really the, the, the background uh, last week. And this week is all the kind of application stuff, which is terrible to do as a pastor you know you don't want to just have application one sermon and and uh, just have background one sermon we did hit some we did hit some application last week but um, so Daniel chapters chapter 7 and um, if you'll give me a, a, a moment I was two chapters away then I closed my Bible when I stepped up here so <laughs> there we go Okay, Daniel chapter 7. This is God's word, uh, eternally true. Beginning in verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind. As he was lying on his bed, he wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, it was told, Get up, and eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts. It had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him, ten thousands times Ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Verse 11. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, 
and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the true meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth, but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying with its iron teeth and, and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell, the horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. Verse 23. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever and ever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Here ends our reading. We have a response of thankfulness that's printed for us in our bulletins. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks indeed. Let's pray. So this is, this is great stuff here, and if you've heard um, this and, and are sitting here and, and have heard uh, this talked about before, um, don't worry, you're not headed in for a whole lot of crazy. Uh, there's a whole lot of crazy talked about this stuff uh, all through the, the, the Christian world. Uh, last week, we, we looked at um, some, of what this, some of what this means, but let's put this in context first of all. This is, you know, Daniel we see is troubled by this news. We see it uh, there in verse 15, uh, right in the middle, and then there, there at the very end. Uh, Daniel's troubled by this, and he he, he learns about what's what's coming uh, in his day and beyond, and it, it's really bad news. Um, Daniel was told in, in chapter 9 that Bob read for us at the front that as he sat there in, in uh, uh, Babylon, uh, which was becoming uh, Persia, uh, he was off in exile. He was not living in Israel. He had been carried off into exile under the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. And the prophet Jeremiah, and we see this in Daniel 9, verses 1 and 2 and 3. You can look there. It's just the page over probably for you. Um, Daniel realized that he had been in exile 70 years and that Jeremiah had said the exile would last 70 years. But as we talked about last week, one of the reasons for the 70 years was to bring people the opportunity to realize, hey, we're not living in the promised land anymore. And we're aliens and foreigners in this land of Babylon. We're a dominated, humiliated people. And, and this was to it cause them to turn back to the Lord and to cry out to him like Daniel was doing in, in chapter 9. But 
we find out from Daniel as we read the whole chapter, but even what we read, that Daniel realizes the people in exile for 70 years had not repented and they had not turned back to the Lord. And so Daniel asks the question, what now, Lord? It's been 70 years, but I understand that's not an automatic return from exile to go back to the promised land. But would you be merciful to us, merciful to us anyway? And God gives this kind of half response. It's been called the, well, it's been called the punt. You know, when you get to the, the end of your uh, four downs, um, either you're going to get the, the first down or you're going to give the ball away. And, and uh, it's kind of that response by the Lord. The people will go back to the promised land, and we see that. If you look at uh, Ezra chapter 1, you see that when the Persians come in and take control, they defeat the Babylonians, that they release God's people to go back to the promised land. Not all the people go back. Daniel stays and he serves uh, Darius, the, 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 the king of Persia. Um, Esther is still there about 30, 40 years later. They're in Persia after this point. But it, it won't be a complete exile. And what we read in, in Daniel 9 is that the answer Daniel gets is that it won't be a 70-year exile, but the 70 years will be multiplied by seven. And, and this was a thing of, of God's law and the Levitical law from the book of Exodus that, that a, a penalty for a crime or a sin could be multiplied seven times over. And that's what Daniel's told, that the exile, you won't come back to complete restoration in 70 years right now. Uh, but God is multiplying that. And that's not a, a, a literal thing where to say, okay, start the clock at 538 B.C. When, when Daniel's praying this, and let's go out 490 years. But it's a general thing. It's like, it, it's a punt. Okay, the ball goes, whoo, way out, into the, way out into the future. And so this is really bad news for, for Daniel because he finds out that he won't be living in a kingdom in which God is ruling utterly, utterly and where the laws of God are being followed by all the people and where he will be able to live at home, back in his homeland, unbothered by enemies. Rather that enemies would continue to, to badger God's people, to persecute, to control uh, God's people. And we see that in this, in this passage, Daniel 7, as well. But if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you're welcome to do that. You can just listen if you want to. That's fine, too, however you best learn and, and take things in. But our introduction, just kind of reviewing what we looked at last week. Um, God cares enough about you. This is what he's doing with Daniel, but what he's doing with us, too. God cares enough about you to set your expectations to set your expectations for this life and the next. That's what God's doing here in Daniel 7, as well as Daniel 9. He's setting Daniel's expectations for this life and the next. He's not saying, oh yeah, it'll just be just a minute, Daniel. Just a minute, almost, just a sec. No, he says, no, 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 no. Four kingdoms, four massive kingdoms, four worldwide kind of kingdoms, and especially this fourth kingdom that comes along, it's going to be worldwide, and it's going to last and, and last and last, and it's going to be extended 70 times 7 until God's people aren't dominated. Uh, and, and so God cares enough to, to set our expectations about what this, what our lives, this, this season of who we are, which is from birth to death, is going to is going to look like and so uh, we see that in verses 15 and, and 28 Daniel gets this bad news um, and that's for that's for us um, our lives are not going to be lives in which the people of this earth are all saying let's follow Jesus and worship him and treat other people like we would like to be treated Let's all love our neighbors as ourselves. Um, let's all do what's just and fair. And our politicians are not going to uh, abandon uh, power and manipulation uh, for their own uh, good. In fact, they're going to be doing that 
and they're going to be working for their constituents, perhaps uh, to the detriment of you and me, um, perhaps. Okay, so God sets our expectations in this chapter. The first thing he says to us, and this is kind of review of all we looked at last week. Number one, um, the kingdoms of men are firmly established and are extending on in time. That's number one, and that's what we looked at last week. Daniel finds out that this isn't the end of the 70 years. This is the beginning uh, of uh, an extended period in which God's people are not, are not at home. Like Homer Simpson says to Bart when Bart says, Dad, this is in the, in the Simpsons movie. Um, Dad, this has to be the worst day in my life. And Homer corrects him and says, No, son, this is the worst day in your life so far. <laughs> And that's the news that, that Daniel gets. Daniel says, this really stinks. We've been in exile 70 years. And, and God says, yeah, but it's just the beginning of, you know, it's just the first seventh, so to speak, or the first eighth, because you got seven times seven uh, going, going forward here. And so you see all those passages there, and, and, and uh, chapter, or verses three through eight speak about this. And so just review for you the... Um, uh, that lion, uh, Babylon was symbol, symbolized by a lion, and, and, and then Persia comes along, symbolized by a bear, and one side is larger than the other. The, the, it was the Media, Medo-Persian Empire that took over. Darius was king of that, and Daniel served him, but the, the Persians were stronger than the Medes, and that's what that's talking about there. Um, talks about three ribs at the east. There were three major kingdoms that the Persian kingdom took in that they conquered. And then there's the leopard, and that's the third kingdom that comes along that dominates the world, and, and that's Greece, and it's got four heads. Greece is famous for having four sections and four kings, the Ptolemies, and the, this kind of thing that, that divided the Greek kingdom into four basic blocks um, there, and they're, they're from like 330 uh, under Alexander the Great until about 68 uh, BC, and then the Romans come in, and the Romans are this ferocious kingdom, what do you think about Romans? When you think about Romans, you think about Roman soldiers, don't you? When you think about Greeks, you think about philosophy and, and people wearing togas and standing around with kind of curly hair and laurel leaves in their hair. But when you think about Romans, you think about this ferocious kingdom of, of iron. Um, they, they conquered and they were ferocious and they ate whatever came before them and then they trampled on the rest as the is the imagery. And, and this is a, a kingdom that's even more extensive than the kingdoms of, of Babylon, of Persia, and, and then of Greece, because Rome brings in, Rome is further Italy, and is further east. And it brings in, in addition to the kingdoms that conquers that, that uh, uh, Persia and Greece and, and Babylon had been over, which is kind of the, the eastern half of the Middle East, and, and going down into Egypt, the Roman kingdom includes all the, the European stuff, too. You know, and so that's why today, and you know, even up in France and, and England, they've got Roman stuff up there, because Roman just conquered everything. But God says it, it doesn't even end there. There's this there's, there's, there's little horn that comes up, and, and, and the kingdom get, just gets extended until everything is complete. Um, so that's what's going on there, and, and the kingdoms of men, Daniel's being told, are firmly established. A, a kingdom of God where God reigns over all the earth, where God is king over all the earth, that, that's, not for, that's not for a long, long time. Uh, it, it doesn't end with Babylon's end here. It doesn't even end with Persia's end. It doesn't even end with Greek, Greek, the end of Greece. You know, Daniel was done shortly after this, these, these words here in the, in the early Persian kingdom. Okay, so that's that. Um, that's that there, and, and um, uh, we go on to number two. Uh, but the good news is this. Um, Christ, will, Christ will return. Um, Christ will return. We talked about last week how even while all these kingdoms are, are, are prospering on the earth and dominating, especially us, the church, the saints, um, that God's courtroom is being readied. And so we see that, you look down verses 9 and 10. In the midst of this, God's courtroom is being ready. Everyone's arriving and setting there, and God's throne is established up there in heaven, and the books are being opened, the books by which all the nations will be, 
will be judged. And then you see that idea again in verse 26. The court will sit. In response to all this and, and the way our lives are, in the future will, in the future, the court will sit. And his power, the, the, this final kingdom who reigns over the earth, Rome and its descendants, right, we're the descendants of Rome, um, will be taken away and completely destroyed uh, forever. So Jesus will return and bring with him, and this is repeat from last week's sermon. I footnoted it so I didn't muddy the, the sentence with all those uh, references, but you can see them in the bottom right. Um, he will return, bring with him judgment, judgment on and elimination. Those are your blanks. Judgment on and elimination of the unbelieving and oppressive kingdoms of men. So Daniel's assured this. But when Jesus comes, he will also take kingship over the whole earth. He'll take kingship over the whole earth himself and giving forever the whole earth to us, his people, the meek, who are the ones who are, who are dominated or given over, as verse 25 says, handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time, for this period of time that we're in. So number three, number three, uh, all our, how, how do we survive? How do we get along in this era in which, you know, God's being honest with us. He's setting our expectations. He's not saying, you'll be okay because I'll, I'll come to reign over you and all the earth next week. He says, no, I won't. Well, he could, but he's saying, don't depend on it. Uh, me coming. It's a long ways, it's a long ways away. You know, four kingdoms, a thousand years, however you want to put it. Um, and Peter deals with that in Second Peter 3. Uh, the coming back of Jesus, you know, to, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a, a thousand years like a day. So how do we get along? Um, how do we get through the now of our lives in view of the fact that sin, our own, and the sins of the nations uh, affect us, um, and affect the world system itself. Uh, how sin brings us difficulty in our lives, hardships. How do we make it through? God answers this, and he says this. Number three, in light of a long era of the kingdoms of men, in light of a long era of the kingdoms of men or the kingdom of man, with sin prevalent, in light of a long era of the kingdoms of men with sin prevalent, and all the trouble for you it causes. So all your troubles today are caused by your own sin and by the sins of others. If sin weren't in the world, you wouldn't have troubles. Yeah, that's just the truth. So how do you, how do you get along with a, a, a sinful environment where sinful men are looking out for their own interests? And sometimes you are too, and that jams you up as well. How do you get along? A, first of all, be patient. Be patient. What's God's word to us? How do we get along in this? What's his message to Daniel? Daniel, be patient. You're going to die, Daniel, before even the third kingdom comes along. That's what God was saying to Daniel. That's what God was saying to Daniel's contemporaries. Persia would be around for hundreds of years after Daniel's contemporaries were dead, and then there would need to be Greece and then, then Rome. Okay, so, so be patient. Verses 3 through 8. Here's the answer. How long, O Lord? Well, a long time. So be patient. Be patient. Um, it's uh, 70 times 7 is going on. So no, are, are we there yet? That's God's answer for us. Don't say, are we there yet? Um, we're not. Not allowed to say that. Can't say that in our car. No, are we there yet? Um, this is the main exhortation of the book of Revelation. If you see one exhortation in the book of Revelation written for the first century people who were enduring persecution at the hands of Rome um, in a, the AD 90s, um, it, it's this exhortation. Be patient. Patiently endure. And so you see that exhortation in Revelation 1.9. Revelation 3.10, I've listed it there for you. Revelation 13.10, Revelation 14.12, and, and in a way what we saw in, in Revelation 
6 this morning. The saints, dead souls who are around Jesus' throne, ask Jesus. And John's getting a, a, a view of this in, in about A.D. 95. What's, he- what's going on in heaven right now? And he's given a view of heaven, and there are these people who have had faith in Jesus, but they were killed for their faith, and they're around Jesus' throne, and they say, How long, O Lord, to you avenge our blood? And Jesus says, in our language, cool it. Um, he says, be patient. I'm gathering in all my people. And I won't avenge your blood until I've gathered in all the saints. It's essentially Daniel's question. How long, O Lord, till you come and rule and reign and dominate the whole earth? And the answer is not for, not for a long time. Bob read for us Romans 8.25, and this deals with this. We're a people of hope. Okay, and right now, we're enduring a lot of suffering. But Paul says, but the suffering we endure now is nothing to be compared to the glory that we will receive when Christ comes. But then he says, Paul does there in in Romans 9, 18 through 25, he says, but here's what it's like. Even the creation now groans for the return of Jesus. Because there are weeds, there are earthquakes, there are tornadoes. It's, you know, all the the, the cosmos, the, the environment is going crazy even. It's not at peace, let alone mankind and us who are believers who are suffering now. And so we're a people of hope. We're looking forward to Jesus' return when it's revealed publicly that we're the sons of God. And Jesus comes back and he says, you are my son. Enter in to the, or daughter, uh, enter into to the kingdom that I've prepared for you since the beginning of time. And so Paul says, so we're people of hope. And that means hope, the word does, Paul says, that means we don't have it yet. And so we live in hope. If we had it, we wouldn't be a people of hope. We'd be a people of had or people of possession. And so that's for us today. Be patient. We live our lives in, in hope of something that's, that's future. That's future. So we suffer during our day. We suffer during our day. Our, our hope is in something else. So, so be patient, uh, waiting for, here's your blank, waiting for God's timing. Jesus said it's, it's going to be a long ways away. Um, but always be watchful. Always be hopeful, because you know not the day that I will return. That the the bridegroom comes back for his bride. But when I come back, let me find you waiting for me. But it's going to be a long time, as he said to John, a thousand years. (laughs) Well, you're going to be dead by then. John, probably not during your era. Okay, a long time. So, So just wait. Wait for God's timing in this. And wait for God's timing as Jesus did. Matthew 4, verses 8 through 10. I've listed it there. You know what that is, Matthew 4? It's Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. And Jesus endures the same temptation as we do. So one of the things Satan puts before him is the, the uh, opportunity to rule the world now. Okay, the kingdoms of men, the kingdoms of men are under Satan's control. This is what Revelation is about. This is what Daniel 7 is about, what Daniel 9 is about. The kingdoms of men are ruling, and they rule by dominance and power, and they don't care who they conquer. They don't care about the people they conquer. They chew them up with iron teeth. This is why Daniel is shaking in his boots or sandals or whatever you wore in Persia, right? Uh, But but Jesus has offered this. Satan says, I will, behold, I'll give you all that. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Behold, I'll give these to you if you bow down to me and worship. But Jesus knows the time is not now. Jesus knows all the earth will be his and he will be king of it, but now is not the time. 
And this is all a, a, a perversion of what's to happen. One, he's to worship the Lord his God only, which is his response. But two, it's not the time for it. Now is the time where he comes in and bears the sins of his people and dies for them so that we can be saved. All the Old Testament saints, all who died in faith, were depending on Jesus to go to the cross bearing their sins and to die. They were in heaven with the Lord based on a check, a check written that will be cashed when Jesus dies on the cross. And so Jesus has to do that. So he says, no. Jesus himself waits for the timing of God's kingdom to rule over the whole earth. And so that's what we're called to do as believers. Just wait. Jesus did. Now is not the time that Jesus will rule over the whole earth. And so don't get your hopes up in election season three years from now or whenever that will be, right? Three years, uh, yeah, three years and a few months from now. Don't get your hopes up. This is just, we're deciding who's going to rule over this kingdom of men, the United States, okay? Um, Hillary or Donald, we're not going to call us up every morning and say, what can I do for you today? How can I benefit you? Okay. Um, so be patient. Be patient as Jesus was. Um, B, B. This brings us into this part. Don't expect in this era in which the kingdoms of men rule, in which Jesus has not come back yet to reign over the whole earth, don't expect the church to get its way in the world. Jesus didn't. Jesus knew when he was in the world, he was not going to get his own way. And he just submits and is slaughtered by the world. That's what happens to our king when he comes into the world. He's slaughtered. He's given up. And who's he slaughtered by? The kingdoms of men. The Roman government, this fourth beast that he had told Daniel about. He knew it. And so he came and he wasn't expecting to get his way. He wasn't surprised by going to the cross. He tells his disciples over and over again, if you read the Gospel of Mark, it's really early in the Gospel. He starts preparing his disciples for that day when he will go to Jerusalem and be betrayed and handed over by the Jews into the hands of the Romans and be crucified. But then he says, but on the third day, I will rise again from the dead. Jesus understood he would not get his own way on earth. The kingdoms were in the era where the kingdoms of men rule. He knew where he was in Daniel's timeline. He knew that he was in this fourth beast and this would extend through centuries. And so he lives accordingly. He lives understanding that, that now is not the time where the people of God get their way. And so what's he do with his disciples? He prepares them to be persecuted. He says to them in his last uh, words to them on the night before he's betrayed, like in John 16, 33, in the world you will have troubles, but take courage, I've overcome the world. That's, that's for us as believers. He doesn't tell his Christians, hey, when I, when I, uh, tomorrow it's going to be a great day tomorrow. Uh, no, tomorrow I will be crucified. And then it's not going to be good for you. Just because I rise up in heaven, it's not going to be good for you. And that's the reminder of the book of Revelation. Just because Jesus is up in heaven and because he has arrived there in Revelation 5 and he's been seated at the right hand of God, just because Jesus is reigning from heaven above doesn't mean that things are going well for the, his people on the earth. Uh, as we read in those two odd verses, which I realized too late after I printed the bulletins in, in uh, Revelation 12, they were out of context for you, but th that, uh, that God's people are being pursued by the evil one through the kingdoms of men in this era. Um, God's people are being persecuted. So in contrast to this, the prosperity gospel falsely teaches that the Christ, being a Christian is an entry into a life in which everything will go your way. zippity doo -dah, right? My, oh, my, what a wonderful day. Uh, that's the message of Disney, not the message of Jesus, all right? Uh, 
going in, into life as a Christian is like, you know, you know how Jesus introduces himself to Saul of Tarsus. I mentioned it last week. It's like Saul says on the road to Damascus, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And behold, I will show you, Saul of Tarsus, how much you will suffer for my sake. You see, when we believe in Jesus, when a person believes in Jesus, they make an exchange. They say, I'm no longer going to be a, a member of the kingdoms of men. I'm no longer going to be a citizen, really, in the kingdoms of men. I'm going to be a citizen of heaven, Philippians 3.20. And if I'm a citizen of heaven, I belong to a kingdom that's not of this earth, that's not of men here. And so I'm going to be persecuted. I'm going to be like, guess who? Daniel and his friends. I'm going to be one who belongs to the kingdom of God living in the kingdom of men. Peter calls Rome, the kingdom of men, Babylon in 1 Peter 5.13. And so that's, that's where we live. And the prosperity gospel says, oh, if you believe in Jesus, everything will go your way. Just pray and have faith and you'll have enough money. You'll get a, a job promotion. You'll have the kind of car you want. And Jesus says, no, you may lose your car and you may lose your money and you may lose your job. In fact, you may lose your life and look at Revelation 6. Here's proof. All these people around my throne have died proclaiming Jesus. And so we make this exchange. We say, do I want a good life now or your best life now? Or do I want a good life for eternity and you see, even the message to Daniel here, even though these four kingdoms will rule and reign over the earth and dominate God's people, and, and look at the language you know, here that, that uh, uh, he oppresses God's people, um, speaks boastfully, wages war, verse 21, wages war against the saints, or verse 25, he speaks against the Most High and he oppresses his saints. We, we make the decision... When we believe in Jesus, I want it good for eternity, even though I may get slaughtered here on the earth, figuratively for hopefully all of us here, slaughtered here on the earth. I'd rather experience the oppression for not being a member, a participant in the kingdom of man with its morality or immorality, with its structures of, of power and pressure and manipulation and getting looking out for number one, for those of you who are older and remember that bestseller in the 1970s, um, I'm going to surrender all that and be like Job. Do with me what you will in this life. Maybe I'll lose everything, but I've got the Lord and he sees everything. And he sees me and he protects me and he cares for me. So that's the exchange we make that the prosperity gospel get, get, gets wrong. Um, the restoration is not going to happen uh, from our 70 years of exile. Um, we're going to be under others' rulership and, and be kicked around uh, for a while. But we've said, here's who we are as Christians. We've said, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Um, you know, it's, it's the no pain, no gain thing that our, our culture has gotten a little glimpse of. This life is pain and eternity is gain. Do you see the emphasis of the Lord here uh, in, in this passage? While he says to Daniel, Daniel, you're going to die in the second kingdom. It, it's, it's so far off. Restoration is so far off for you. But look, Daniel, the kingdom of the Lord, when it comes, will be forever and ever. For his dominion has no end. You see that repeated through this whole passage over and over again. It's this unending kingdom, and we say, I'm in. That's what we've said as believers. I'm in. I'm in for that. Okay, so C, there, C. The kingdom of man now rules over civil life and over culture across the globe. Uh, Hollywood and, and, and various uh, 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 nations around the world are not uh, seeking the Bible to see what kind of morality to promote or how to treat each other. And so see, God says to you and to me this morning, brace yourself. Brace yourself. Expect persecution, suffering, and not to be received. 
not to be received uh, because you are part of God's kingdom. And so again, verses 21 and 25 there, what do the kingdoms of men do? They sometimes specifically, in addition to all the conquering they do of other people, they sometimes specifically come after us, the church. Um, that, there are uh, um, two groups, maybe probably more than this, who are free to persecute now in the United States. Uh, I know this from watching Blue Bloods. Um, you can say anything you want about Russians, the Russian mob and all that kind of stuff. You can say anything. You can make any kind of stereotype against Russians that you want to, and nobody from the cultural elite will um, say anything to you about it. Russians are fair game, and Christians are fair game. Anything, uh, uh, anything but somebody saying, you know what? Marriage is between a man and a woman. And if you're, if you're born with a certain anatomy, you know, that's who you are. Um, if we say that, then we're open to persecution, aren't we? Right? We can't say that or we're, we're mean bigots. We're not mean bigots. We're just exercising a little bit of logic, right? It doesn't take a lot. Um, how, how, how silly all this, all this is. That we're, but but we're, we're persecuted along with the Russians today and probably some other groups I'm just not, just not thinking of here. But, but, but you know, in our culture, we're, we're just free game. We're free game for persecution. So brace yourself because you're part of God's kingdom. This is the message to Daniel and his people, and this is the message to us as, as believers. Um, 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 6 talks about when Jesus comes back, he will trouble those who have troubled us. So what's the expectation? We will be a troubled people. People will trouble us all through life, but when Jesus comes back, he will trouble them. Um, 2 Timothy 3.12 listed there. And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, that is believers, will be persecuted. Revelation 12, 17 and 13, 7, uh, that, that uh, we're being sought out, that uh, Satan and his forces, Satan's using governments and, and uh, different various segments of society to come against those who follow Jesus, or as I mentioned to you, John 16, 33, in this world you have troubles, but take courage, I've overcome the world. So you will not be received as Jesus was not. Uh, if, you look in your, if you look in your bulletin uh, there in our declaration of the gospel, I think it is on the front page. Yeah, there it is, our declaration of the gospel. So Jesus understands our experience that we're not received that if we're at a public gathering or amongst friends who aren't believers and we say, you know what? XY chromosome means this. And what's the other one? It's XX, right? XX chromosome means, yeah, I, I, I was pre-med. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> XX, means, XX means the other. If we say that, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get brutalized probably. Um, but, but Jesus knows what it's like not to be received. He knows what it's like to be rejected. Look at this. He was in the world. Jesus was. He came in. Uh, John opens up with Jesus created everything that we see. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, Jesus is the creator, the world did not recognize him. So Jesus comes in the world, born of the Virgin Mary, comes and, and he's born and, and the world doesn't recognize. Hey, this is our creator. Okay, we see that in the Gospels. People don't recognize that. He gives hint of it in making the waves be still in doing away with diseases. This is the creator exercising his sovereignty over the creation when he does these things. Getting rid of leprosy in people, um, causing blind people to see and deaf people to hear. This is the creator working and giving people a clue that he's the creator. Okay, But the world didn't recognize that, even his own disciples going on. He came to those who were his own, the Jews. Okay. But his own did not receive him. Okay? They put him on a cross. But here's the good news, verse 12. Yet to all who received him, Christians, both those who were Jewish, like his disciples and, and the early Christians, and any Jew who receives him today, and Gentiles, but as many as received him, to, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become 
children of God. And so Jesus knows what it's like not to be received or accepted because of, of, what, you, of what you believe. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're told that Jesus gave the, the uh, um, uh, acceptable or, or, or uh, right testimony before Pilate, uh, and he was persecuted for it. Are you a king? Pilate asked him. I am. He spoke the truth. And what did he get for? Crucifixion. Crucifixion. Now, what's his crime? Uh, king of the Jews, written in three languages above his, above his cross. So brace yourself. Um, brace yourself. Um, you won't be received as Jesus wasn't received. If they hate the master, they hate the servant, Jesus said. Okay, D. D. Next, know that God will protect you. That's good news. Know that God will protect you. God will protect you during this era, even if it's through, in the midst of, while you're experiencing persecution and death for your faith. Okay? Um, note verse 25. He will speak, that is, the, the governments of the world will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints, that's us, and try to change set times and the laws that's been done in, in history. Uh, especially under uh, communist re regimes. They did that in China uh, as well. Napoleon did it, um, went, tried to go to what, like an eight-day work week with no Sabbath there. Um, but the, the saints will be handed over to him. But here's the good news. Even though it's long, it's for a limited time. Time, times, and a half a time. It, it will end. It will end. Uh, and so we see that God will protect us. God will protect us. What Bob read for us in, in Revelation 12, 6 through 16, shows that even though we are being pursued at times and, and persecuted at times by the world, that God protects us or keeps us uh, by, uh, by his great power. Even if that protection means that he allows us to die, he protects us through our death and brings us to his side. So his protection doesn't mean bad things won't happen to us. His protection doesn't mean that we may not die for our faith. Now, in this country, that seems unlikely that we'll die for our faith. But even if so, know that the Lord's protection is around you and surrounding you. And that just as, if you read Revelation 12, as Satan came to get Jesus, that God snatched Jesus up to his right-hand side and placed Jesus on his throne. And that's the, the, the uh, passage there in Revelation 12, what it communicates to us, that God protects us even in the midst of persecution. If you're made fun of, even if you lose friends, even if you lose uh, work opportunities because of your faith, God sees these things and he protects you. And so D there in your uh, outline there underneath that, though Jesus died for his kingdom, he was protected and preserved in his resurrection. See, Jesus' resurrection, his ascension, is informative to us. God sees when his loved ones, his son, capital S, and his sons and daughters, lowercase s and d, are persecuted and losing our lives, but he sees it and he watches over us and he brings us to his side. Okay. Um, Peter says to uh, his own people, in in the uh, 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 book of Acts, Christ Jesus, who while testifying, uh, or he says, you, you, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. That's Acts 3.15 listed there for you. Next thing. So God, know that God will protect you. And then E, despite hardships, despite hardships for your faith. Okay, now if you have hardships for your faith, what are you tempted to do? To abandon your faith, right? If I just quit standing for my faith, if I just keep quit talking about Jesus, if people are making fun of Christians and calling them bigoted or making fun of anybody who would believe, you know, you watch, I watched some Bill Maher. Is that, am I saying that bit Maher? You know, when you say something that doesn't sound right, M-A-H-E-R, Bill Maher, uh, this week, and you know, and, and he just tries to obliterate anybody who's Christian. And what he does there is he takes a very obtuse view of what the Bible says, and then when he gets someone who knows the Bible better on his show and explains it, he, sh he shuts them off, and he essentially says, I want to believe my 
obtuse and incorrect version of Christianity so I can make fun of it and feel superior. Okay. He doesn't he doesn't listen to those who explain what the Bible's talking about. But you know, wouldn't it be easier just in the face of the Bill Maurers in our life, uh, for us just to say, oh yeah, I don't believe any of that stuff. Then we'd be accepted. We'd be one of the guys. And Peter deals with that and uh, what he's talking about in 1 Peter in chapter 4. He knows they're being pressured just to run with their old crowd. And that people all around, all these believers in the church are saying, what? Why don't you run with us in the, as Peter calls it, the same flood of dissipation that you always ran with us in? Keep it on doing, you know, the same old stuff. Why, what, are you holier than thou now? You know, and people uh, uh, work to get us to be unfaithful. But God says to us, in, in contrast to this, Eve, despite hardships for your faith, live faithfully. Live faithfully to Jesus. Just as Jesus, in light of greater hardships in his life than we will ever have, just as in light of Jesus with these greater hardships, lived faithfully to his Father. Okay, so you know that the, uh, the, the saints are in trouble in this era, verse 25. Um, but Jesus, in the midst of persecution from the Jewish leadership, persecution from the Roman government, um, John, uh, John 4.34 tells us what Jesus' life was about. He says, I've come to do the will of my Father. All that the Father speaks, that is what I do. And I don't do anything outside. I don't do anything outside of that. Or 1 Peter uh, uh, 2, 21 through 23 talks about Jesus in the face of, of suffering. Bob read this for us. In the face of suffering, he went to the cross. He remained faithful. He committed no sin. In the face of suffering, of walking through suffering, of knowing proclaiming who he was. I am God. I am the king. I will receive worship from anyone bright enough spiritually to understand who I am. I will receive the worship of these people. And he does like the man he heals of his blindness in John 8 and 9. Jesus knows he's going to get, you know, all kinds of fire against him from the Pharisees for that. And he does. And he's in this heated exchange with them over that. But Jesus remains faithful to the Father, doing what the Father sent him to do, to die for his to die for his people. So he lives faithfully. So, number one there under E, don't let persecution wear you out. Don't let persecution wear you out. In verse 25, um, he will speak against the most high and oppress his saints. Uh, it's 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 the idea that he will wear out, just tire out his saints. Uh, by his oppression, and a saint is a, a Christian, a Christian. Um, so don't let persecution wear you out. Instead, remain set apart. Those are your blanks there. Remain set apart uh, from the evil behavior, from the evil behavior of the rest of the world. In other words, live as a saint. The word saint is, is associated with the word sanctification or sanctuary. It's associated with the word that we translate holy. It means be set apart. In your behavior and, and God emphasizes this in this passage all of a sudden out of nowhere God's using this word saint holy ones and that's where we're to be in the in, in, who we are to be in the midst of a sinful world in the midst of a world in which we're being persecuted because we're not living according to the sinful world we're to remain saints set apart in our behavior not joining in even evil behavior but being set apart and standing out from the world from the evil behavior of the world. So everyone else is doing it, or everyone else does this, or nobody cares, everyone does this, nobody's going to be upset. God says, no, 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 no. That's not who we are. We remain set apart from the world, living according to, to his instructions that he gives to us in the, in the Bible. Uh, God puts it this way to us in Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So Jesus came. It teaches us to say no. So what does it teach us Christians to do? Jesus having come, what's it teach us to do? It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, 
the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in this era in which we wait for God's kingdom to fully come and to, to dominate and be the only kingdom that is on the face of the earth, we say no to ungodliness. We remain the saints, those who are set apart, even in the midst of the persecution we receive. So Paul picks up on this in Galatians 6, 9. He says, let us not be weary in doing good. Don't be weary. Don't be worn out. Don't get tired out of doing good. For, he continues, at the proper time, get the timing aspect, at the proper time, when Jesus comes again, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So every good thing you do, you will reap from that. And so just keep doing good things, one good thing after another after another, living according to God's law, one item after another after another, because every good thing you do is a seed you're planting that you will reap, not now, that's the prosperity gospel. If you send in money now and touch my TV screen, you'll reap it now and you'll get a mysterious check in your mailbox. Uh, but you will reap at the proper time, Paul says. So endure, patiently endure, live faithfully to Jesus, and at the proper time, when Jesus comes back, when the court session is in session, and the evil one, like Revelation 19, is cast into the lake of fire, as it speaks of in verse 11. We will reap if we keep on going. We don't give up. And we won't give up because we just keep sowing seeds and reap that harvest at the proper time. Or as Bob read for us, 1 Peter 4, 19, listen to what Peter says in light of the evil world in which we live. So then, those who suffer according to God's will, or with Christians who are obeying Jesus and suffering for it. He says, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator in doing what is right. Like Jesus I'm going to get, he says, I'm going to get obliterated for this, but I'm committed to doing what my Father has sent me to do. To live sinlessly and to offer myself up as a sacrifice for all my people, Old Testament and New Testament to come. He commits himself to his Father in doing what's right. And so that's the commandment for us too and what Daniel receives. Be a saint, be set apart, even though all these hard things are coming that make you shake, verse 15 and verse 28. Okay, last thing for us, number two. Number two. Jesus tells us that reward in the next life is especially great. Reward in the next life is especially great for those who are faithful to him and who suffer for it. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Uh, this is from the, the end of the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, blessed are you who are persecuted because of righteousness. See how this all fits in? Daniel, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to live under persecuting kingdoms, and, and, and all my people will until I come back. Blessed are you who are persecuted because of righteousness, for yours is the kingdom of heaven, the eternal, everlasting dominion that belongs to you. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, because of Jesus. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. If you're persecuted, great is your reward in heaven. From the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Or as Bob read for us from 1 Peter 2, 19 through 23. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. Be, be, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable to God. So God commends you. God looks down and he sees you. And he sees he's being faithful. She's being faithful, even though she knew it would bring her hardship. God commends that. He commends it more than when it's just easy to obey. 
you know, in front of each other, it's easy to obey. <laughs> and that's good, you know, follow the Lord when we're in each other's midst. But when we're outside of each other's midst and we know I'm going to get persecuted because I say, well, I'm a Christian in the midst of a group making fun of Christians. He sees that and he says, great is your reward in heaven. You're like one of the prophets who stood up for me, who proclaimed me and got persecuted for it. He says, for to this, Peter says, to this you were called, that is doing good and suffering. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. Do good even though it means suffering. That's what Jesus did. He did good, even though it meant suffering for him. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges righteously. And that's what we do. We follow the Lord and we entrust ourselves to the one, to God, who judges righteously, knowing that he has promised us great is our reward in heaven if we follow him and are persecuted for it. So F there, lastly, quick point for us. Lastly, have hope. Have hope. That's the message for Daniel, despite the disappointment that 70 years wasn't going to be it. Have hope and have that hope fixed on the return of Christ. That's the other half of this message to Daniel. Have your hope fixed on the return of Christ. Have your hope fixed on the, the everlasting kingdom of the Son of Man, as it's told here in this passage. This everlasting kingdom of righteousness, just like we're told to have in Romans 8. So conclusion, summary, summarizing all these things up together. Your life as a Christian will be marked with hardships. That's what Daniel's being told. Life on this earth will be full of hardships. But be patient, endure, endure, and look and hope for the new era. Look and hope for the new era that Jesus will bring at his return. Endure now and look and hope. Have hope. Your hope will be realized. It will be realized in the new era which Jesus will bring about at his return. Let's pray.